Hey, Debbie here, and welcome to Debbie Adar TV. Today I have someone very special with me that I'm going to interview. I want you to hear his greatness. He is one of the main reasons that I get to call myself a very lucky girl. He is my friend, my confidant, my mentor, as well as my husband. He is a world-renowned dental ceramist who has gone all over the world teaching his technique, as well as an incredible inspirational speaker who inspires people's lives all over the world. I am so proud to introduce you to my husband, Mr. Pinkas Adar. Now, I just wanted to pick his brain because I want you to know how incredible he is. In my journey through self-exploration and through self-improvement, I only want to be around positive people who walk their talk. And I can honestly say I get to spend a lot of time with this guy. And he is really the only person that I know personally that truly walks his talk. So I want you to hear how he, what he came from and how he does these wonderful things that he does. So welcome, Pincus. Thank you very much. I'm so honored to be your partner and uh, be in your presence. Thank you so much. <laughs> And, live your life. and he's a sweet talker. <laughs> My dreams. So, so I wanted you to tell everybody uh, about the beginning of your life. You know what? I mean, because I know you came from a very different childhood than, than most people did. So I want you to explain to them kind of what happened in your life, you know, how you got started into this journey to greatness. I was born in Georgia, which is Soviet Union. And my dad was imprisoned by Soviet Russian country when I was age five. So I saw this transformation. The freedom wasn't existing there. You cannot have the freedom of speech. So I was raised through that communist regime, which was very, very difficult because we were Jews and they didn't like Jews. And so there are lots of other obstacles beside the religion. So at age five, because I was the man of the house, I was strong, uh, and I thought I'd take the space for my dad when he was gone. So I took care of the family. I used to do uh, chores such as fixing a refrigerator at age five. That was kind of funny. Uh, I used to go shopping. And you would go shopping by yourself? Yes, yes, by myself, age five. That was kind of weird, but I was doing it. Many, many hours of walk actually carrying heavy stuff. So you mean you weren't driving a car when you No, <laughs> no. You know, that was my humble beginning. But what happened is that my dad came out of jail when, when I was around nine, and we escaped to Israel. The process of jumping there and being through wars and to be um, a serving as, as a soldier, as an army experience, I learned a lot of things through my life that life is short. So I had to learn uh, fast through experiences. Now, I was also lucky that I found some passion in my life by the skill I learned and I was good at it. So I was really fortunate at that. And I immersed myself into become the best I can be, no matter what. And if you want to find a passion, something that you love, no matter what it is, you'll be able to do it for free, but you're so good that people will pay you. That's the attitude that I had, no matter what. And I was working for many people, but I never thought I was working for anybody. I was always doing it for myself. So that's what kept me going, because I was everything I do, is I do it for myself to better myself. And just touch briefly on what you did in the Army. When they sent me to the Army, I was in a tank division. And uh, because of my skill set in the laboratory and the creativity I had with my ceramic skills, they transferred me to the hospital, the, the laboratory of the army. During that time, I've seen lots of friends and, and people that from the tank division were harmed in the army. So that gave me a little bit of awakening in a way that, look, uh, my life was spared for a reason because I have a purpose. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to have gift to help those, you know, less fortunate people, young kids. I was 19 when that happened and I never seen people blow up in tanks, missing limbs. So I actually had to help them replace eyeballs or ears and face and people were burned. So th there were lots of, lots of things I saw there that just appreciated my life more because I was still there. And so I promised myself that no matter what, I'm going to follow my dream. And my dream was to explore my abilities and, and travel the world and do what my dream was to 
become the person I always wanted to be. Because my beginning wasn't so hot, and we lost everything when we went from Russia because we had to get out. And my dad, you know, he was working three jobs, so and my mom was working as well, and we really didn't have a family life because they were always working to support. And I was actually working when I was 13 in textile uh, after school just to support the family as well. I was bringing the money to the family. So there were lots of things that I had to do to, you know, follow my dream. So fast forward to when you got into dental technology school. I know that you, you really didn't want to get into technology, dental technology, that your mom actually took you to a a place and they told you that that's what you should do when you yes. did an, uh, like an aptitude type of test. Um, so then you found yourself after you thought that it was really gross, ew, teeth. <laughs> yes. Then you found you know that you loved it. Explain that process. So you know in life you have some opportunities that come across and you have to recognize them because uh, there's a saying that say opportunities don't knock on every door. What they do they stand in front of the door for you to recognize it and I was young, I was ignorant, so I didn't know. I know I wanted to be a car mechanic, I loved cars and I always wanted to have cars but I didn't know how to get access to cars because we didn't have money. And so when I went to school to try that dental laboratory technician and when I heard that I said oh gross, I was scared of needles, I didn't want to deal with blood and saliva and everything else and I say no but they told me to explore and try it and when I tried it it was more like sculpting, you know, drawing and things like that. It's more artistic. And I was good with my hands. I could have good coordination with my eye and I could do it fast. So I said, well, that's kind of fun. So when I tried it, at the test, people were talking about it, how fast I was and how good I was. I was an example. So I said, well, that's pretty cool. And so that's what kept me at school. In fact, I remember uh, one year we were at school the whole time and then school assigned you to a private laboratory. Uh, which my, one of my first mentors uh, in a private setting was Baruch Hindik. And uh, I was lucky enough to were introduced to them, to that group. And, uh, you know, he, he was one of the best ceramist or technicians in Israel. And uh, I, I was pretty good and I thought I was really good. I knew everything. And uh, he actually, uh, when I started working at three days and three days at school, uh, he knew I was a little bit cocky and arrogant because as a kid you think you got it, everything, you know everything. Uh, he told me, you can be good or you can be better. And I'm so thankful for him that he, he wasn't like my accountability partner because he always sat with me at night to show me stuff. And I'm so happy that, grateful that he told me that because all my life I was trying to be better than my best. And that's really what kept me driving to, through this journey, which wasn't easy, but uh, I, I did for myself and, and I knew it can be always better than best. And so that's what I encourage people always to try to do better than best. Because once you settle and once you think you're really good and you don't need to get better, then you go backwards. And that's uh, something that I live by even today. So there's a saying that faith is in the preparation. And I know I've heard stories from your friends and from your family about, you know, how immersed you made yourself into maintain, into attaining this goal. Um, you know, like you would ride the bus and you would be carving teeth out of soap. You would bring soap with you and carve teeth. I mean, he was really, I mean, you just, you immersed yourself in, in your goal to, main, to reach your goal, correct? I use my talents and my skills to sharpen my axe by practicing so I want to be better than my best not to compete with others but my, myself so every time like you said I was on a bus I used to carve teeth with a block of soap and I was just practicing and that gave me the edge to be faster and better and the coordination got better and better and so that's one of the things I remember I was doing it and that was fun but as a kid I mean we didn't have as many distractions we did have distractions like people partying and and drinking and but I wasn't one of them I wasn't uh, the type of person that follows the crowd you know I always like a nerd you know I always work hard I stay late yeah. and that's one of the many things that we have in common it's never a partier either you know I didn't like to you know I'd rather read a book and go out and party yeah. so yeah we had that in common okay let's fast forward so you got out of school and you were working in a dental laboratory and then you decided that you wanted to expand your horizon so tell tell us about the offer that you had gotten so I went to Europe 
and I did whatever I can to work in some laboratories. I had a little car, traveled around Germany, Paris, Italy, everywhere around and met lots of good friends and connections. And in fact, and you know, bad things happened through my journey, but nobody knew about it because it's nobody's business, my business, so I have to take care of it. Uh, I remember uh, for saving money traveling through Europe, I had to sleep on park benches because it was cheaper, free, basically. So you put the suitcase in a, in a little uh, box at the train station and go out and sleep on the bench with all the homeless. You know, that was kind of fun. Uh, experience, it's like, I call it five stars treatment because you can see the stars. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's my attitude. Uh, in fact, I remember homeless people come to me to ask for money and I say, well, if I had the money, would I be here? I had an offer. I had an offer that was very, very tempting and I believe that for many people that would be an excellent offer even today. But that was about 30 years ago. And the offer was around $10,000 a month. A month. $10,000 a month. It's $120,000 a year. That's a lot of money, even today's standards. And as age 22, you know, I mean, I had nothing. I only had a big dream, but 300 bucks maybe. And you know, it was very difficult to say no to that, to go after my dream. I, I don't want the money, I just want to go do my stuff. You know, I want to follow my dream. I want to do what I, I can do and the division that I had of myself. Now, I heard you say one time, the reason that you could turn down the 10,000 a month was because you knew that if somebody was offering you 10,000 a month, that on your own, you would be worth over 100,000 a month. Yes, yes. So I thought that that was really a good point and that's, a lot of foresight for somebody that's that age, you know, yeah. to be able to say no to that and see the big picture. So I really admired that. I thought that was a great story. When I was in the army and I was working with laboratories, I used to charge five or ten dollar, five or ten dollar per unit of, of restoration. So if you make five of them, it's like 50 bucks. And many people are typically do five units. But my goal was to work on myself to do so good but also to speed it up and find a ways to do it fast. I was producing over 50 units, 50 units, five zero. Today we have machines can do that. I was the machine of, I was the cat cam of those generation. People couldn't believe it. And the reason, because my mindset was different, you don't have to be slow to be good. In fact, my idea is if you're slow, you don't know what you're doing. It's like a, a race car driver. You have to be more alert. When you know where you're going, you can go as fast as you can. So that was one of, one of my, my things I was doing. I always timed myself. And so when I was working, when I was young, that's my discipline. I look at it, the Olympians, you know? Let's see what, how fast can I do it. So that's one thing. So think about five to $10 per unit. Now, $10,000, that's why they offered me that because I know I can make 50 units a day that's a lot of money. We can make lots of money with that process, but it's slavery almost. You know, I didn't want that life. I knew it was good, gets me ready for work, what I'm going to do, but it wasn't there to stay there. And I saw the vision of what I want to be, and that's why I turned it down because I knew how to make money. Money wasn't that difficult because 50 units, if it's $10, it's 500 a day. That's a lot of money. What happened is that I was afraid. I was afraid of conformity. Because when I see so many people conform with good lives, you know, good lives in many standards, they don't follow the dreams and they have regrets. They always say, I wish I've done this. I have so many friends who have good lives, they have family, kids, car, beautiful house, and they all say, I wish I did this and I wish I did that. And I didn't want to be one of those people. And today, 30 years later, I can make ten, over $10,000 in one hour. Uh, giving a speech, a keynote speech, or even in our business to produce, because I can do it, and if instead of $10, $10, now the same unit I'm doing now, it's over $1,500. So that's like multiplying how many thousands of percentage. That's the best investment you can do in yourself yes. by improving yourself. Yeah. You cannot change anybody else. The only one you can change is yourself. And that's what I was working, and I'm still working, because I know there's more in me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know when we met over 26 years ago that that was what you emphasized to me too. That I was the most important person, that I had to invest in myself. So, And, and he lives by it. That, I think that's very important. Who would you say would be the main influencers in your life? I think people you meet in life, all of them influencing you, no matter who they are, for good or bad. 
But to me, my influence beside my God that protects me and, and has a plan for me and the angels that help me to go through all the tough times is, of course, watching your parents, uh, watching your family, siblings, and see their qualities. For example, the, the work ethic I learned from my dad and mom. I mean, they worked like three jobs. I mean, that was crazy. They had the guts to move from Russia to a new country. They didn't speak the language and uh, they left everything behind. So that was uh, an example for me. You know, maybe that's why I borrowed the strength for me to move and, and do it. Because if my dad could do it with kids and family, why couldn't I? You know, what, what's my excuse? So, I mean, those things are one of the strengths. But then, you know, Baruch Hindik, one of my first mentors, so Willie Geller, and then uh, Ronald Goldstein, and then there were David Garber on the profession for levels. But there's so many influencers, even people who I meet today that I teach and I share, uh, uh, you know, my experiences to make them better. I learn from them. So everybody is, is, a, is, a, is a teacher and a student. So. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I really admire about you is that you are always so grateful for everything and everybody that comes into your life. You know, whether it's, it's maybe a good experience or a bad experience. Because um, I remember asking you, know, you several times, why are you going to go hear that speaker? And what is it that you tell me? You tell me because... I want to learn. I'm like, what can he teach you? And your response is, you know, everybody knows something that I don't know. And if I learn something that I shouldn't do, that's just as good as if I learned yeah. something that I, that I should do. So you're always so grateful. And, and what, what made you become so grateful, such a grateful person? Is that something that you just, oh, well, that you were blessed with or, or what is it? It's, it's, a, it's a commitment, it's a decision that I made to myself to be more. So if you could pick three life-defining moments, what would they be? There are so many life-defining yes. moments. I, I believe, in fact, the speech I gave at the, at the event with Honor Brown, I said that every day is a life-defining moment. Every choice you make, it's a life-defining because every choice you make, there's a circumstance and, and consequence to it. Um, and we make our choices, we, we design our lives based on the choices we make. So I would say that if we never moved from Russia, probably I won't be the person I am today. So that's one, when we moved. Life-defining moments where my dad was taken away, there was no freedom. So you never know. So I'm blessed that I'm in a free country. And, and people take it for granted, but I don't. I love it. I think this is amazing, the best country in, in the world. I love Israel, I think Israel is free, but I mean, the, the stress that you have, and I live there and I love it too, but you know, it's a different atmosphere because you know that people try to attack you all the time. And, um, and that's also a life-defining moment, you know, to go through that struggle, the army, because I've seen lots of death and casualties and, and people same age that I was, and I'm still here. And see, that's defining moments. Uh, the other thing, I mean, moving to uh, America and saying no to $120,000 in cash at age 22, that's a life-defining moment. Because if I stayed there, I probably wouldn't be here. I'll have a different path in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is uh, when I say no to another venture of $500,000 that was, you know, easy, easy to make that. But, you know, I want more, not because more money, but I want more out of myself so that... Sometimes you are in bondage of a good life, pretending like it's a good life, but you're not expand yourself because you feel so comfortable in your own jail cell, basically. You're stuck there and you never get out. So for me, I think every decision you make and I make, I mean, meeting you is a life at fine moment. We have a great, great marriage and great, um, you know, friendship and, and, and we're growing together. So I know that since I've known you, as I said, for over 26 years, you, I have never heard you say that you couldn't do anything. I've never heard him say that. So what do you think when you hear people say, I can't, or I would, but, what, what goes through your mind? You know, our mentor, Les Brown, also defines that people's life are controlled or designed by the stories that tell themselves. Basically, when somebody makes a decision or to do something, how many times somebody tries that? before they quit. Guess how many? Zero. Zero, exactly. <laughs> yes. And the reason is because the stories they tell themselves in their own head and they 
talk themselves out of it. Good idea. Either they, they, they do that first before you even tell their family members or friends, but then there's other group. You know, they have a great idea, and then they share with someone who is not a winner or their family members. It's, oh, no, you shouldn't do that, or you shouldn't do that. You know, if you have an idea, first you have to trust yourself and you believe in yourself. And then if you want to gain strength from that particular whatever idea you had, find those people that can help you with that, someone who did it before. Don't ask a, a poor person how to be rich, you know? Uh, don't ask a plumber to fix your teeth. I mean, it doesn't work that way. So you have to work with the right people. So, uh, and that's the thing. So for me, when somebody says, yes, but, yes, uh, I try, this is more like a polite way of saying no. You know, because that's what I believe. You know, somebody said, I'll try that. There is no try. Either you do it or you don't. There is no such thing. Either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. I mean, there's no enough way. What is it Tony Robbins says? Trying is a loud way of doing nothing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So do you have any other words of wisdom for us before I let you go? <laughs> Everyone needs to do is to really look deep inside them and see what is your purpose in this life. And this is how I, I gauge myself and I, that's what I ask every day and, and when I plan on goals and visions. It's always have imagination. Don't let anybody knock down your dream. Don't ever let somebody else's opinion shape up your life. Don't. Because they don't know. And the reason they don't know because they've never done it. And second, and they are afraid for you to, to succeed in your journey because then you're going to leave them alone. So there are different reasons why people do that. The other reason, maybe they worry about that you may fail, but you know, without failure, you never succeed. Yes. You don't even know the difference. So believe in yourself, believe, trust the process, trust yourself and surround yourself with the right team, right people. Don't surround yourself with those naysayers and those people who drag you down. Either find people that pull you up or drag you down. It's up to you, really. And, uh, you know, you have to do some cleaning the house, you know, sometimes you have to get rid of some friends that you thought they were friends and you hang around. Uh, and I think Darren Hardy talks about, you know, you have friends, you have a friend list, make a list. So this is a one minute friend or this is five minute friend. This is a weekend friend. So it depends what kind of value they bring to your mind, the mental mind and your relationship. Because so you just have to be focused, be focused, have a clear vision and then find the right team and take action. Because without action, you can talk as much as you want. Because I met so many people who have a book knowledge, and that's what I talked about this weekend with Anna. Uh, uh, you know, everybody, if information was the only thing that everybody needs, then everybody's going to be skinny, rich, and happy, right? It doesn't work that way. And book knowledge doesn't mean you're a success. I see lots of consultants who talk about the right thing to do. They don't, they never done it themselves, but they know the, the, the lines, they know they memorize the quotes and other stuff. So to me, I think you have to watch whoever accomplished something that you want to accomplish and follow their footsteps and then try to create your own path because I think that's what I've done and that's what I'm keep doing it. Nice. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And as I told you, I know he didn't disappoint. He's, he's a phenomenon in his own right. And if you like what you heard, then we actually have some relationship videos that are coming out that we've done together about our relationship uh, that we've had that's dynamic and gets better and better every day so check it out it's going to be on debbie adar tv and if you like what you saw today subscribe and yep. also check out my website debbieadar.com thank you so much for your time i hope you enjoyed it we'll see you next time bye thank you